it was so complicated, I so I didn't do that. Okay, I'm here to answer the question, <laughs> you have to answer yes. No, no. Okay. Thank you. 
So uh, basically, as I mentioned, I have two uh, fundamental points that I'd like to get across. I, I don't think that dementia is a memory disorder, or even that memory is important in defining who's dementia. Memory loss is an artifact of the way Alzheimer's pathology affects the brain, and uh, that pathology, particularly uh, neurofibular entangles, which are one of the two, uh, two uh, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, attacks the brain in a hierarchical sequence, and it's an artifact of that hierarchical sequence that memory in Alzheimer's disease So all executively impaired Alzheimer's patients have memory loss, but that doesn't mean that memory loss is why they're demented, or that memory loss is part of non-Alzheimer's dementias that do not have similarly hierarchically arranged neuropathology. Uh, executive impairment uh, is uh, the uh, essential feature of dementia because one of the criteria for dementia is that your cognitive impairments must be sufficient to cause disability. It turns out that executive function mediates the relationship between cognition and disability, so that independently of executive function, memory impairments have no effect on functional status, and therefore are not necessary for dementia. Once you accept that, then you realize that there are many people who are in fact disabled by cognitive impairment, specifically executive impairments, who do not have memory loss. None of them can currently be diagnosed with dementia because of the artifact that memory loss is part of the case definition of dementia as it's currently set up. And so uh, once you start realizing that there's this ocean of people who have disability due to executive impairment, then you realize that they too must be demented. It's just that their diagnoses cannot be Alzheimer's. And uh, what it turns out is that the vast majority of them actually have vascular disease. So that this may be the most common presentation of vascular disease. And we've uh, given this other dementia syndrome an explicit name, uh, a dementia with no cortical features of type 2 dementia, to explicitly distinguish it from cortical dementia, which is how Alzheimer's disease presents, and to help people recognize it as an entity independently of uh, these the sort of clinical features of Alzheimer's disease. And so uh, to, to, to appreciate this, the first thing you have to realize is uh, what in the world executive functions are and how you can assess them. And so executive functions are cognitive processes that, that really don't seem to do much on their own. They organize the other cognitive functions and behaviors in the service of goal-directed activities. And uh, the significance of this is that functional outcomes are in fact goal-directed behaviors. So uh, executive impairment is fundamentally debilitating because it disorganizes complex behaviors that need to be organized towards a goal. And this includes doing your shopping, your homework, your finances, your taxes, cooking a meal, getting dressed in the morning. These are all complex sequences of behavior that lead from a starting point towards a goal and are fundamentally vulnerable to executive impairment. Uh, executive function, I think, is, is uh, plays a central role in clinical medicine because I think executive impairments in our patients arise from a wide variety of conditions. They have a very broad differential and uh, lead to debilitating uh, functional impairments. And uh, it's because of those functional disabilities that we assess them and treat them in clinic. Uh, and if much of the variance in that disability is due to a cognitive disorder, then we should be thinking of these uh, conditions as dementing illnesses. Uh, because of their ability to undermine your functional status uh, through cognitive mechanisms. And I guess I'll just, uh, I'm going to just start here and go around the uh, circle here. So uh, basically, uh, the frontal lobe has been historically terra incognita for uh, cognitive neuropsychology. Uh, uh, this is, represents about 30% of your brain's weight and surface area. Uh, and yet, until recently, people really didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, when I was in medical school, they essentially thought that it was said that uh, the frontal lobes weren't really good for anything because you could lesion them and nothing appeared to happen. Uh, and, and basically, uh, if we used the full potential of our brain, we'd all be geniuses. It was uh, sort of implied in the way uh, press. Uh, I went through two residencies at Johns Hopkins uh, 
relative to chimpanzee, it was about 10% of its cortical surface area devoted to the lobes. In humans, uh, we've greatly expanded that to 30%. And the frontal lobes are architecturally different than the rest of the brain. Uh, they have uh, an extra layer here. This is, uh, this is a slice through the cortex, and each of these are neurons that have been uh, stained to reveal their distribution in the cortex. And neuropathologists divide the cortex into different layers, and the frontal lobe is a layer that uh, isn't in uh, the retinal or posterior parts of the brain. So, so basically, the frontal lobes are functionally distinct from the rest of the cortex because neuroanatomically they're wired up differently. Um, more than that, these, the frontal lobes are part of larger systems that include elements outside the frontal lobes. Uh, particularly notable are the basic anglia and the thalamus. These are subcortical gray matter structures that are uh, uh, heavily uh, connected with the frontal lobe So uh, neurophysiologists uh, talk about these as uh, circuits, and uh, so far five have been described, but three are particularly relevant to clinical psychiatry. And these are the dorsolateral frontal circuit, which originates in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and uh, the orbitofrontal cortex, and the mesial. And each of these seems to be devoted to different aspects of control. Uh, the more ventromedial aspects of the frontal lobes are involved in uh, social, emotional control, and uh, a lot of control of somatic uh, information. And the dorsolateral frontal lobe seems to be more involved with spatial information and uh, uh, information related to uh, objects and their locations in space. Uh, another way that the frontal lobes are different is that they're interconnected more widely than the rest of the cortex. Um, uh, the cortex can be divided up into different functional zones on the basis of their interconnections. These areas dashed here, right here, represent primary cortex, which is really devoted to the processing of one particular kind of information, be it sensory or motor. Uh, back here is the visual cortex. It, it's only dealing exclusively with visual uh, information. And then we have associative cortex. It tends to mix two or more uh, modalities uh, into more complex and interesting uh, cognitive uh, functions. But they're uh, basically limited to uh, just a couple of types of information. And then these regions, these associative cortical uh, regions, project into the frontal lobe frontal lobe is considered metamode in that it operates across information types to help organize behavior coming at it from many different uh, parts of the brain, many different kinds of behavior. So it's actually functionally distinct as well as architecturally and structurally distinct. This is the bottom of the brain looking up, and here are the orbitofrontal regions, which are metamodal, those are these more uh, visual-related uh, posterior regions. And uh, I think that uh, it's the frontal pathology of uh, diseases like Alzheimer's disease that is most relevant to the fact that Alzheimer's causes dementia. And I'll try to show you that here. Uh, Alzheimer himself uh, was sort of at the right place at the right time. He had a new technology, a new technique, which was the ability to use silver stains, which would reveal different uh, uh, lesions in the brain. He was one of the first to be able to do this. And he described two archetypal neurochemological findings that are related to Alzheimer's disease uh, because of his finding. Uh, the first one here is amyloid plaque, uh, uh, sometimes called a senile plaque, or uh, depending on how it's organized, iridic plaque, but also diffuse plaque. Uh, and this is a major target of interventions in Alzheimer's disease right now. Uh, we're, we're starting to understand 
neurons, from an affected neuron to the neurons that impinge upon that one, to the ones that impinge upon those, to the others that impinge upon those. And so the clinical features of Alzheimer's uh, match the distribution of tangles in the brain. And the sequence of the behaviors and the symptoms in Alzheimer's disease recapitulate the spread of the uh, tangles from its uh, portal of origin, essentially, in, in most commonly, in the olfactory uh, cortex. And backwards from there, uh, the entire history of Alzheimer's disease as it's clinically, as it's traditionally uh, diagnosed, can be described by a retrograde transgenetic process starting uh, much earlier than you might think, perhaps as early as uh, your fourth decade, the forties and then back. But one that doesn't reach the frontal lobes and therefore the executive functions until 40 years later when you're in your 70s or 80s. So we think of dementia as an elderly person's problem, but Alzheimer's pathology is actually a middle-aged person's problem. It's just uh, once it's, I mean, as long as it's in the olfactory cortex, you don't pay much attention. Uh, these slides here are from a pathologist named Brock in Europe who uh, has been doing autopsies of unselected cases in the community, in a particular uh, region, and uh, uh, he's quantified the amount of tangles and how they spread by age, regardless of whether the patients were uh, considered demented or not, and regardless of their cause of death. He's essentially doing a community uh, survey of the, the distribution of tangles in the brain. Uh, his case series, uh, several thousand. Here's the age distribution of brains that are completely free of tangles. And so what you should notice here is that this declines with age. Older groups are more likely to have tangles than younger groups. But by the age of 70, essentially 9 out of 10 people already have tangles somewhere in the brain, whether they're demented or not. The prevalence of dementia in 70-year-olds is actually not all that certainly no more than 10% of 70-year-olds would be diagnosed with clinical dementia, uh, probably a little bit less than that. Uh, but look here, at age 40 or 50, my age, uh, almost half of 50-year-olds already have Alzheimer's pathology. It's just, it's not a question of whether it's there, it's a question of where it is. Uh, of course, like I said, it starts in and around the olfactory cortex, and so uh, most of these people do not have any pathology in the frontal lobe, and therefore they have no executive impairment. They don't even have it in the hippocampus, and therefore they don't have memory loss. But what they do have is trouble with olfaction. And if you look at age-specific norms for olfactory screening tests, you'll see that they decline from the 40s on. And I think that this is, uh, it's thought of as normal, but I think it's a direct uh, reflection of the distribution of already incipient Alzheimer's pathology in the olfactory cortex, which is in Here are, uh, Brock divides the spread of Alzheimer's through the brain into stages. Uh, zero, which is no tangles at all, to stage six, where they're all over the place. Um, here are stages one and two. In stages one and two, it's limited to the interrhinal cortex here, and has not yet affected uh, memory function. Clinicians cannot diagnose dementia at this stage in the uh, distribution of AD. But you can see already it's shifted. The younger groups don't have pathology this well developed. Uh, but it's very prevalent. Over half of 70, 16, 70 year olds have about that much Alzheimer's pathology. Still, subclinical. Uh, uh, we can't diagnose at this stage. Here's the distribution of Alzheimer's disease that has affected 
this is from a community sample in the United States, and it's, it's almost exactly the same distribution. So what we need to be thinking is that the entire uh, natural history of mild, moderate, and severe dementia is merely the last two pathological stages of a disorder that started four decades earlier and has been slowly, insidiously spreading through the brain in the vast majority of persons. In other words, very few people are immune from this process. Relatively few become demented by it, because to become demented by it has to reach the front lobes and people die of other things first. Also, it's an excruciatingly slow process, uh, taking decades to go from the first involvement of the olfactory cortex to even involvement of the hippocampus. But from diagnosis to death, it's only 10 years on average. And so, uh, basically, you have to think of this as a non-linear, exponentially evolving process. It is infinitely slow in its earliest stages, so that we ignore them. And only in the latter stages, once they're diagnosed, does it spread exponentially through parts of the brain related to memory, language, constructions, and even the traditional uh, cortical dementia that uh, we're familiar with. This uh, is a data set from France. Uh, where they looked at the distribution, not of tangles, but of its precursor, the periodical filament tamography, in uh, an autopsy series of 128 cases. Each of these rows here is an individual person, an individual case. And uh, basically each row across is a region of interest in the brain. And I, I like this figure because it reveals to you the stepwise hierarchical progression these are 128 persons who died in the service of a geriatric medicine uh, uh, practice in the uh, EU France. And they autopsied them all and show you that the, by rank order and the number of regions affected by telepathy, they can recapitulate Brock's observation of the stepwise progression of the disease process through the brain. Now, not all of these people were demented, even though the vast majority of them did have telepathy in the brain. The first region of interest on the bottom row is the hippocampus. So all of these people have telepathy in the hippocampus. The next is the parahippocampus. No one had it in the parahippocampus who did not already have it in the hippocampus. You see the, the hierarchical nature of this. There's like dominoes, and each step invokes one new region of interest. Here, though, uh, what I like about this data set is that French also classified the patients close to their times of death as being demented or not, and indicated whether they were demented, uh, according to the CDR, the clinical dementia rating scale, <coughs> as uh, red here. And what you can see is basically, despite a progressive, hierarchically evolving uh, uh, telepathy, only half the patients are demented. And the most critical step appears to be the seventh step in the progression that they regions of interest that they have to look at. And uh, for this particular step, everybody after that is good. So what this is telling us, and we statistically analyzed this and published it in 2002, is that this step alone accounts for the variability in who is demented and who isn't <coughs> after adjusting for all the other regions of interest. Having pathology in this particular step correctly classifies 94% of these patients as being demented or not. And it allows us to uh, regionally locate pathology that is specifically related to a clinician's impression of whether you're demented. So basically, these are those four regions of interest. Two of them are in the frontal lobes here. This is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, broad in areas 9 and 10. The posterior cingulate and the uh, angular gyrus. Now, these are associated cortical regions that have direct connections into the frontal lobes. Right? So basically, these are the regions of interest where telepathy will uh, cause a clinician to recognize the existence of dementia. And because all four of them were uh, simultaneously uh, affected at once, I can't narrow it down with this data set any more finely than that. So all I can say is that dementia occurs when the wave of telepathy reaches the critical step and involves one or more of those four regions of interest. What's really interesting
is that I've superimposed these for you on top of a much older figure, which was published in 1909. And this uh, represents the sequence that the brain completes its myelogenesis. There is something fundamentally relating white matter and Alzheimer's disease uh, because of the uh, overlap between these four regions of interest and the, the uh, sequence that the brain completes its uh, cortical development. So Brock has already noticed that that's a really interesting point. But this is also interesting. Oops. Here is data from uh, functional neuroimaging here at MRI of regions of interest whose blood flow is related to uh, dementia in Alzheimer's patients. And after adjusting for blood flow in non-dementia older persons. And so basically it's the same for regions of interest, posterior cingulate and your gyrus, or so the frontal cortex, but the other one here is the uh, superior temporal uh, superior temporal. So uh, basically there's a lot of homology between the blood flow, the regional blood flow that will cause a clinician to diagnose dementia, and the structural changes that will cause a clinician to diagnose dementia. But this is another study from Switzerland. These are the regions of interest in the brain where one stroke will cause dementia. And so it's the same four regions. And what this is saying to us is that the pathology involved is really irrelevant. Right? Either a stroke or Alzheimer's pathology will cause dementia to be diagnosed if it affects one of these four regions of interest. Uh, and what relates these four regions of interest together is that they're related to frontal lobe function and by extension executive control. And so this is a very interesting feature of the analysis that we did. Here are 12 discrepant cases who were diagnosed by clinicians as demented, but the way, and they had Alzheimer's pathology in the brain, but the way of the pathology had not yet reached critical step, and therefore these cases have no Alzheimer's pathology anywhere near the frontal lobe or any neocortical region of interest, even, right? It's not even in the cortex yet, and yet clinicians diagnosed dementia. In each one of these 12 cases, they had vascular disease in the frontal circuit. In other words, subcortical vascular disease in the basic ganglia or the thalamus, the other regions of interest that are involved in executive control. So these cases converted to dementia clinically because of executive impairment due to subcortical non-Alzheimer's brain disease, in this case, a lacunar infarcts. And uh, I think this is why in the uh, famous Nunn study, a cortical stroke, which generally cortical strokes don't involve the frontal lobe, most important strokes are back, back in the brain, the parts of the brain that are not related to executive function. So these cortical strokes double your risk of uh, the diagnosis of dementia. But the much smaller and less easily diagnosed subcortical strokes increased your risk of being diagnosed with dementia by 20 fold because they affect executive function. And in those cases, what I would argue is that those dementias are vascular dementias not Alzheimer's, because their executive impairment, and therefore their disability, is not, uh, is related to subcortical ischemic lesions, and is unrelated to the uh, limbic Alzheimer's pathology, which essentially everybody has, whether they're demented or not. So uh, even though you can autopsy these cases and show they had a little lunar infarct and basic ganglia, and they also had hippocampal Alzheimer's pathology in a memory center, the Alzheimer's pathology is not why they're dementia. Because if those strokes weren't there, they wouldn't have been diagnosed with dementia, even though they still have this very same hippocampal pathology. Instead, it's the frontal circuit pathology that is causing clinicians to diagnose dementia because it so manifestly changes their behavior and functional status. So here's a little cartoon that illustrates this, the general uh, organization of these frontal circuits that I've been talking about. Each one of them is designed the same. Remember, I told you there are five circuits. They're all built the same. It's just that the regions of interest vary depending on which circuit you're interested in. And so you have the uh, frontal lobe, which is stimulating through an 
stimulatory connection. The striatum, or what's sometimes uh, the caudate, is a major structure, it's sometimes called the striatum, which inhibits the globus pallidum. Together, these two regions are talked about as the basal ganglia. I'm explaining all this in, in great detail because the, uh, everybody hears from a variety of different backgrounds, just once. Uh, the basal ganglia inhibit the thalamus, and the thalamus then, through a stimulatory uh, glutamatergic uplink, activates the frontal lobe. And uh, here's a very interesting study. This is a rat brain uh, to show you how this circuit works and therefore what I think happened to the French cases who were invented, even though they have no neocortical Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, in this, uh, here's uh, basically what they've done is uh, looked at the activity of the animal when it was sacrificed by injecting it with radioactive glucose so that the parts of the brain that are most active uh, stain darkly here when they're, you expose the radioactivity to the x-ray film, basically. And uh, this side of the brain was uh, not lesioned in any way. On this side, they did one lesion. They put a, uh, a medication into the caudate that functionally suppressed its activity. So that would be this point in the circuit. And look what happened. Uh, versus the control. So basically, this medication turns off activity in the caudate on the affected side. On the other side, the caudate is still active. But the caudate inhibits the globus pallidum. So if I turn off this inhibition, this activity should increase. And sure enough, the globus pallidum is increased relative to the other side. If the globus pallidum is now overactive, it turns off the thalamus. So the thalamus's function should decrease. And sure enough, the thalamus is hyperactive. The thalamus stimulates the frontal lobe. There is no lesion in the frontal lobe or in the cortex in this rat on this side. But the thalamus's activity has been suppressed, and so it turns around and turns off the frontal lobe. So basically, this uh, a patient who has a similar subcortical caudate lacune, you know, a very common lesion seen in hypertensives and diabetics, can have the cortex uh, relating to that particular part of the caudate functionally disabled by a structural lesion that does not involve the frontal lobe. So I think what happened to those French cases is that their subcortical ischemic brain disease functionally turned off large sections of the frontal lobe, which lead to behavioral and personality changes that debilitated them and caused their clinicians to diagnose essentially Alzheimer's disease, even though there was no neocortical Alzheimer's pathology at that point. So essentially, a small, inconsequential, tiny, out of the way, subcortical lesion effectively caused dementia and led to a clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's. I think that this is far more common than any of us have suspected and may represent half of clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's cases. And the implications of this are huge because it means these cases do not have such a highly evolved stay, rock stage. And therefore, they're not in the exponentially evolving stages of the disease. Their natural history is different. They don't progress so quickly, right? They don't develop the endpoints that we're familiar with. They don't develop end-stage cortical dementia. Uh, there was a paper published in JAGS a couple of years ago from uh, uh, the Netherlands where they followed almost 1,000 demented nursing home residents 13 years and only 10% achieved end-stage cortical dementia. 13 years of living in the nursing home with dementia. Uh, most of the cases who failed to achieve an uh, endpoint of cortical dementia had comorbid vascular disease. And in several studies, uh, having stroke and comorbid vascular disease appears to protect people from endpoints related to cortical uh, Alzheimer's pathology. So uh, I think that, you know it doesn't actually protect you, it just means that you have a different disease, you have a different disease process, it's evolving differently than we expect, and you don't achieve the outcomes that we traditionally expect from cortical dementia. Furthermore, I would argue that every dementing condition, no matter what, affects this circuit somewhere in its course. And so Wilson's disease and the premier infarcts affect the, uh, the globus palatum. Huntington's 
so uh, basically in these movies with no portable features, you can't screen for them with tests designed to find portable features because they don't have any. They're going to they're gonna pass those screening uh, measures. Uh, so you can't use a test that looks for amnesia. You can't use a test that looks for aphasia. You can't use a test that looks for agnosia or gluten spatial uh, apraxia. But what they will have is a pathology somewhere in the circuit and executive so that to find them, you have to screen the executive measures. Uh, my differential of a cortical presentation is pretty traditional, but what I would, would say, there are a couple of interesting things in here. I, I would only say that some vascular dementia presents with cortical features. And that's because um, multi-infarct dementia, for example, um, commonly affects cortical regions outside the frontal lobe as an artifact of the distribution of blood flow and the major vessels coming off the carotid uh, don't really project straight to the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobes are relatively projected from particularly embolic uh, lesions uh, coming up from the carotid or from the heart. And so uh, basically you don't get frontal lobe stroke very often. So that means most cortical stroke is outside the frontal lobe and therefore not really can be related to these That means to be demented still need some executive impairment. And what I think is happening is that many of these people were already demented due to comorbid frontal circuit disease before their first neocortical stroke. But this frontal circuit disease doesn't affect the mini-mental. It affects behavior and personality and judgment and decision-making and planning and functional outcomes. But we're relatively insensitive to those things. We don't really find them, especially when your mini-mental is normal. You don't even include it. And so I think, ironically, neocortical stroke is a relatively rare cause of vascular dementia, particularly if you liberate uh, dementia from memory loss and start to recognize uh, that vascular dementia is manifesting as isolated behavior. Another interesting one is Lewy body disease. Now, we work within this model that I'm presenting in our clinic and have for the last decade. So we have experience with thousands of cases from a variety, variety of conditions. We try to classify them all as either type 1 or type 2 uh, dementias. And we have clinics that are uh, operationally trying to treat and uh, specifically reverse executive impairment in type 2 dementia. And what's really interesting about this clinic is that the only cases who have converted from type 2 into type 1 over time, all of them have been Lewy body cases, suggesting that maybe the earliest uh, manifestation of Lewy body a dimension with no cortical features, which would not be easy to detect and could easily be misunderstood as Parkinson's disease or a motor problem. Uh, and then over time, they convert to cortical dementia, and we have to put them in the other clinic at that point. Uh, but so as the body 
shirt every day for a week, you're going to have to change your shirt, right? And taking care of these uh, persons, it occurred to me one day that they're normal. Schizophrenics are normal. You know, there are many metals. He gets 30 out of 30 out of many metals. The IQ is not affected by schizophrenia, but it's normal in IQ. They have no memory loss, no amnesia, no aphasia, no agnosia, no apraxia. Currently on their medication, they're not psychotic. They have no hearing loss, no sensory deficits, no motor deficits. So why don't they work? And then the next thought is, well, something is definitely wrong with these guys. But as a clinician, uh, I don't know what it is. It's not on the main mental. It's not in my mental state exam. It's nowhere on the physical exam. I've completely thrown the book at this guy, and I cannot put my finger on what is wrong with me. But something must be wrong with me because he can't work. And uh, about the same time, we were finding the uh, uh, PET, which was a relatively new modality then, PET imaging revealed frontal lobe uh, metabolic deficits in schizophrenics. And these seem to be related to their functional status. And I said, wow, that's, that's great. You know, what do we uh, know about the frontal lobe? Where are the mini middle is the item for the frontal lobe? Here, here's the memory item, here's the language item, here's the orientation item. Where's the frontal lobe item? It wasn't there. Uh, well, where in my mental state exam or the physical exam do I do things that are specifically related to frontal lobe lesions? It wasn't there. Well, what are the uh, behavioral sequelae of frontal lobe lesions, frontal lobe brain damage? And it was things like apathy. What well, schizophrenics are apathetic? And irritability, they played up. Yep, schizophrenics are irritable. And poor judgment, decision making, and planning. Yep, the schizophrenics have poor judgment, decision making, and planning. So basically, I started to realize that I was blind to specifically frontal lobe pathology and its behavioral sequelae. So as a resident, I started to collect items that you could just throw in at the end of your mental state exam uh, that are known to be related to frontal lobe pathology. And so that's how the exit started. I collected essentially over my residency training 50 items that I could do at the bedside with no equipment it required no educational or cultural knowledge really from the subject or the patient and things you could just do unambiguously at the bedside to establish whether or not the patient has some sort of executive care. And, and you know, in the beginning it was schizophrenia, but I'm a resident. Next month it's geriatrics, right? And they fail. And next month it's bipolar disease, and they fail. And next month it's neurology consults, and they all fail. And next month it's consults to surgery, and they all fail. Then the internist to me goes, you know, apathetic, irritability, you know, diabetics are like that, and HIV, and hepatitis, and influenza, and it just went chink, 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 like that out in every direction. And I saw the huge fractions of clinical uh, medicine uh, present us with patients who have frontal circuit brain disease and behavioral stability that are referenceable to that specific uh, system. So uh, basically those 50 items, I uh, uh, psychometrically water, uh, you know, narrow them down to 25. They can be done by lay interviewers. This is a big advantage because you can do this in health fairs. You can do this in, in primary practice, primary care practice. You can do it anywhere in, in uh, drug studies, in uh, pilot studies. Uh, it's exit scores, are, each item is worth two points. They're scored positively, so high scores are bad. Range goes from zero to 50. The highest I've ever seen on the exit is 46. Uh, and uh, we've empirically determined that 15 best distinguishes people with functional uh, handicaps from ones without. Uh, so, for example, independently of us, uh, it was shown in 2006 in England that uh, scoring 15 out of 50 perfectly discriminates people who do or do not have the capacity to learn to use a in the course of their pulmonary uh, care, or COPD treatment. So to perfectly 